to session four of Christ Episcopal Church's Lenten teaching on Bach's St. Matthew Passion. My name is Bill Duxbury and I'm looking forward to spending some more time with you as we explore one of the true masterpieces in the Western musical catalog. As I record this, my wife and I have just finished up participating in the church's Palm Sunday service via streaming. Yes, we paraded around the kitchen waving our palm leaves while singing all glory, Lord, and honor. Although I have to admit, our five-month-old puppy, Jammer, wasn't sure what to make of this, but desperately wanted to chew on these palm leaves. I find it wonderful that this year's Passion readings are all from the Gospel of St. Matthew, which is the exact same text that Bach has scored here. I couldn't help but feel a sense of anticipation as we get to see how Bach handles some of this, this text musically to make it even more memorable. Hey, as a quick review, let's go over a couple of items before we delve into some truly great music. First, if you're starting this series right here on session four, stop. Go back and listen to the first three sessions. It'll definitely help you out. Second, if you have not downloaded the notes and translations, please do. This is filled with all sorts of notes for you to refer back to. It includes a German to English translation so that if you're listening to this in German, you know what they're singing, please download that, print it out, whatever you need to, to have it available. Now, just in case you decided not to listen to the first three sessions, let's review a few items. First is, what is a passion? When we say a passion, what do we mean? Well, quite simply, a passion is the telling of the last week of Jesus' life. Normally starts with his entry into Jerusalem, which we celebrate as Palm Sunday. Through his crucifixion and burial, which we memorialize as Good Friday. Very purposefully, a passion does not include the resurrection that we joyously celebrate as Easter. Instead, it is meant to focus on the pain and suffering of Jesus and end at his death and burial. Originally, a passion was a spoken dramatic reading, but by Bach's time, which was the early 1700s through the mid 1700s, it had become a musical presentation of this gospel drama. Now remember, that Bach's worldview was centered on German Martin Luther Reformation theology. And the whole theology that Martin Luther unleashed upon us in a good way, um, it, Bach was just totally involved with that. But Bach was also influenced by some other aspects that was going around in his society at the time. The biggest one was the Enlightenment, which brought about a sense of order, of discipline, of everything can be explained. The other thing I want to review before we press on are the major themes that Bach always returns to in the St. Matthew Passion. And there are five of them. So let me review them real quick. All right, the first is that mankind is sinful and is incapable of being good enough. In other words, there is no way that we can be good enough for God. Second, Jesus, as both God and man, was sinless. He had no sin. He had no fault. Third, Jesus loved us so much that he wanted to die for us. That his death for us was not a death of obligation, of requirement, but that he genuinely loved us so much that he wanted to die for us because he knew that's what we needed. Fourth, that it was necessary for this sinless Jesus to shed blood 
and die in order to redeem mankind. That it had to be a sacrifice and it had to be a painful and bloody sacrifice for us. And then fifth, we should be thankful to Jesus for all of these. That we, as people who have been redeemed because of all those first four themes, should be thankful. So with those in mind, let's buckle up because we're going to listen to some truly great music over the next hour or so. So let's jump into part two of the music. Part two starts as a prelude, and it's number 36 in your libretto if you need to find your place here. Remember, at the end of part one, Jesus has been arrested and abandoned. The priests and the scribes have come. He's been betrayed. He's been arrested. All of his disciples have abandoned him. Musically, Bach starts part two in the style of what we call now a French overture. Okay, you're going to say, what is a French overture? All right, fair question. I get it. A French overture was a popular form of music in the early 18th century. It's noted by a lot of what we call dotted notes. Um, dotted notes would end up giving you a rhythm as you go through the music of bum, ba bum, bum, ba bum, bum, ba bum. It gave you sort of a regal and royal fitting, which, to be honest, the uh, French king Louis the Sixteenth. He liked this type of stuff, and it became popular throughout all of Europe. A good example of a French overture would be the opening of Handel's Messiah. If you've ever listened to the opening of that, you hear that kind of rhythm. This musical start of part two, um, as soon as the music started, would have reminded Bach's listeners in the St. Thomas Church in Leipzig that, hey, it's time to take your seats and listen again. We're getting started up again. Now Bach takes no time to bring us to a question through the alto that all believers have asked in hard times. Where has my Jesus gone? Where has my Jesus gone? Notice that the alto, the alto is in dialogue with the chorus. The alto is asking the hard questions. Where is Jesus? Will I ever see Jesus again? What can I say to my soul when there appears to be no foundation? The bottom has dropped out of everything. And the chorus, in dialogue with the alto, gives these trite answers. Well, let's go look. You're such a good person. Jesus must have turned from you. But together... We can find him. Well, despite all of the alto's friends' admonitions, the alto at the end of this number returns to the question, where has my Jesus gone? This question goes unanswered for now, which Bach accentuates by refusing to let the piece end on the tonic chord. Rather, and I want you to notice this at the very end of it, musically, he ends it on the dominant chord. And remember when I talked about resolved versus unresolved. Musically, he leaves this question unresolved. This question is left hanging. <laughs> Oh, Lord, is my 
We now move to scene 10 and numbers 37, 38, and 39. Note that in musical number 37, the previous question of where has my Jesus gone is immediately answered by the evangelist. He has been seized. Note also that Bach harmonizes this to return back to the tonic, musically also answering the question, where has my Jesus gone? There's no doubt here, musically and verbally, what is meant here. In selection number 38, the chorus reflects back at us, first with anger, the lies and the deceitfulness of the world, but by the end of this number, they return to a more prayerful mood, realizing that without God's protection, they will never be able to persevere. Note as the chorus sings with lies and with false testimony, the cascading, diminishing fifth chords, giving a dissonance to the music. It returns to a more soothing harmonies for the last two lines of this prayer. Like all chorales, this was one that comes from the hymnal used in Leipzig. Also, like many chorales, it was composed by the famous composer Anonymous. All right, number 39, I can't help but point out when the false witnesses testify, Bach has done their testimony in a canon. Uh, they are singing exactly the same words and notes with little to no imagination. It's like when we sing, row, row, row your boat. It doesn't take any imagination for us to sing it. In this way, he is showing how rehearsed and false their testimony is. Notice how when the witnesses sing, destroy the temple, that musically the notes are in a cascading fall. And when they sing, and rebuild it in three days, the music is doing a stair-step upwards movement. Coincidence? Nah, not with Bach. Nothing's coincidence with Bach. <laughs> Die Herren, die es umgegriffen hatte, 
führten ihn zu dem hohen Priester Kaiphas, dahin die Schriftgelehrten und Ältesten sich versammelt hatten. Petrus aber folgte ihm noch von Ferne bis in den Palast des hohen Priesters und ging hinein und satzte sich bei die Knechte, auf das er sähe, wo es hinaus wollte. Die hohen Priester aber und Ältesten und der ganze Rat suchten falsche Zeugnis wider Jesum, auf das sie ihn töteten und fanden keines. Antwortest du nicht zu dem, dass diese Fiede dich zeugen? Musical numbers 40 and 41, we move to a tenor ariosa, followed by a tenor aria, once again allowing us to reflect upon the action that has gone on. And I want you to notice something on number on both of these, actually. Bach uses a very sparse arrangement to reflect Jesus' silence. Once again, he returns to one of his major themes that Jesus is bent on suffering for our sins. Jesus' silence is not passive, but rather part of his mission to take on the burden of our falsehood and lies, our very sin. In number 41, the aria, as if to accentuate how utterly alone Jesus is, Bach accompanies this aria with only the viola da gamba and a hint of the continuo, but very little. And notice the musical accompaniment and moves along with some long bowed phrases and then into some short herky-jerky phrases. The long phrases meant to reflect the patience that is being asked for, longed for, prayed for. And then the herky-jerky emphasizing the, no, I will not be patient anymore. Bach recognizes a universal human condition, since we're all like this. Unlike um, instruments of the violin family, the viola da gambo has frets, more like a guitar, which allows for better intonation. Also, instead of having four strings, the viola da gamba typically has either six or seven strings, and they're tuned differently than a normal uh, violin or viola. The intervals of a fourth for most strings with a third on the middle string. More like a modern guitar. Confused? Well, don't worry. The takeaway is that between the use of the frets and the extra strings and the tuning, you get, a, you get many more harmonic overtones from the instrument, giving it a rich, deep luster. Mein Jesus schreit zu 
Falsche Zunge sprechen, Geduld, Geduld, Geduld. After the tenor interlude, as the tenor sings about patience, we move back to Jesus before the high priest. I want you to notice a couple of things musically. 
that when Jesus speaks before the high priest, in addition to the halo of strings that we hear every time Jesus speaks, except for once, and we're getting to that, notice how the instruments in the orchestra are playing motifs that sound like clouds scurrying by as Jesus sings about the heaven. The chorus, now acting as the assembled elders, sings, He deserves to die in a quick, polyphonic manner, giving the sense that they have quickly come to judgment without much regard to the facts. They have lost all patience with Jesus. In number 43, notice as the chorus sings, Tell us, tell us, tell us, tell us. The emphasis on the hissing notes of the S sounds as if they are serpents. You can hear that as they accentuate all that. In number 44, Bach, in what is now kind of a regular uh, theme for him, turns the chorus on a dime and brings his listeners back directly into the story with a very familiar chorale. And this chorale, first used in number 16 in a similar manner, it gives a rhetorical answer to, the, to who has struck you. It is, after all, all of us who would be guilty of Christ's torment. Und der hohe Priester antwortete und sprach zu ihm, Ich beschwöre dich bei dem lebendigen Gott, dass du uns sagest, ob du seist Christus, der Sohn Gottes. Jesus sprach zu ihm, Du sagest, doch sage ich euch von Wird's geschehen, dass ihr sehen werdet des Menschen Sohn sitzen zur Rechten der Kraft und kommen in den Wolken des Himmels. Da zerriss der hohe Priester seine Kleider und sprach: Er hat Gott gelästet. Was dürfen wir weiter zeigen? Ist, siehe, jetzt habt ihr seiner Gotteslästerung gehöret. Was dünket euch? Sie antworteten und sprachen: Ist das du das du? und schlugen ihn mit Fäusten. Etliche aber schlugen ihn ins Angesicht und sprachen. In scene 11 of The Passion, we move to Bach treating the two characters that betray or deny Jesus. We deal with Peter's denial, and we deal with the fate of Judas. And surprisingly, as we're going to listen to and hear, Bach treats both of them in very similar manners. Let's deal with Peter first. In number 45, we get the whole interaction between Peter and the people in the palace uh, patio area. 
Um, notice in number 45, as the dialogue goes on, um, that Bach uses music to emphasize certain words. Note how the, on the key words such as deny and swore, that the recitative uses very high notes, underscoring the tension of what is about to happen. And then in number 46, when the evangelist sings, and he went out, he moves to a very high B note at the very extreme of a tenor's range. This is the only time the evangelist used this note in the whole Passion, as if Bach is emphasizing how isolated Peter feels at this time. And the very last phrase of the evangelist recitative here, and wept bitterly, is a tortured and twisted melisma, reflecting the absolute depth of angst that Peter is feeling right now. The final word, bitterlish, bitterly, musically, drops down to its knees in despair. Petrus aber saß draußen im Palast, und es trat zu ihm eine Magd und sprach, Und du warst auch mit dem Jesus aus Galilea. Er leugnete habe vor ihnen allen und sprach, Ich weiß nicht, was du sagst. Als er aber zur Tür hinausging, sah ihn eine andere und sprach zu denen, die da waren. Diese war doch mit dem Jesu von Nazareth. Und er leugnete abermal und schwor dazu, ich kenne des Menschen nicht. Und über eine kleine Weile traten ihn zu, die da stunden und sprachen zu Petrus. Da hob er an sich zu verfluchen und zu schwören. Ich kenne des Menschen nicht. Und alsbald krölte der Hahn. an die Worte Jesu, da er zu ihm sagte, wie der Hahn krähen wird, wirst du mich dreimal verleugnen. Und Leaving Peter weeping bitterly at the end of the recitative there, we move to one of the most beautiful arias throughout the whole work, and it's scored for an alto. And while I'm talking about a beautiful aria, um, Bach has an abundance of riches. In this piece alone, he probably has five arias that are so stunningly beautiful. Most composers would love to have just one of them to their names. But here Bach has at least five. In this case here, Bach has scored this aria for an alto, as if Peter, who was a bass, is so overcome with his moral failure that he cannot even speak. The violin is scored obbligato, which is with a plucked cello. The sparseness of this arrangement gives the sense of Peter's utter aloneness as he contemplates how he is denied Jesus. While the alto is giving voice to Peter, she is also singing for all of God's people. Which of us has not had to face our own moral failures, just as Peter is facing right now? 
both the Evangelist's last word in his recitative and the Aria's last word are the same, as if to strike home Peter's mindset. It's the German word bitterlich, bitterly. Bach, however, right away brings the chorale in. And Bach is usually never more than a measure or two away from God's grace. And in number 48, he brings that home to us. After giving us a front row seat to Peter's and our own moral failure, they immediately return back to God's grace and mercy. By using a chorale that was familiar to his listeners, he once again draws them into the scene, allowing them to say, yes, I too have denied you, Jesus. And yes, I too have received your grace, mercy, and forgiveness. As if to emphasize this, Bach has the orchestra and chorus crescendo as they sing, by your grace and mercy. This chorale was written by Johann Schopp. He was 1590 to 1667. He most famously wrote the chorale Jesus, Joy of Man's Desiring, which Bach has scored. The text of this chorale is by Johann von Rist, who was 1607 to 1667.
absolutely beautiful ending to this corral. I do not deny my guilt, but your grace and mercy are far greater than the sin that I always find within myself. Truly Bach leaves us in this uplifting moment here of after Peter's absolute moral failure, he returns us back to God's grace and mercy. And yes, we will always find that sin in ourselves. From here to the end of the scene, Bach then turns his attention to the other disciple that failed, and this is Judas. We've had the front row seat to Peter's denial, and now we do move into Judas. This entire section is made up of terse, short phrases. The music shows how Judas, having fulfilled his betrayal, is no longer needed by the chief priests and elders. While he asks for forgiveness from them, they turn their back on him. The chorus declaring, now acting as the chief priests and the elders, what is that to us? In number 50, as the evangelist sings, and went away and hanged himself, I want you to musically notice how the music coils around itself, creating a noose, and there is a precipitous drop on the word hanged as the note goes from high to low. As the priests decide what to do with the money, Bach returns to a canon much like he did with the false witnesses, signifying that the priests are simply going through the motions of doing the right thing. With both number 47 and number 51, Bach has scored the accompanying arias with these two disciples with a solo violin. While number 47 was an aching melody, the violin in number 51 is playing a rolling melody, as if it were like the 30 coins being tossed on the floor and rolling along the temple floor. Note that the scene ending phrase, prodigal son on this, the prodigal son who went astray eventually returned to find grace and forgiveness from his father. This gives us, and Judas, hope that just like all prodigal sons, we too can return and find grace and forgiveness. Des Morgens Abend hielten alle Hohepriester und die Ältesten des Volks einen Rat über Jesum, dass sie ihn töteten und bunden ihn, führeten ihn hin und überantworteten ihn dem Landpfleger Pontio Pilato. Da das sei Judas, der ihn verraten hatte, dass er verdammt war zum Tode, gereute es ihn und brachte er wieder die dreißig Silberlinge den hohen Priestern und Ältesten und sprach, ich habe übel getan, dass ich unschuldig Blut verraten habe. Sie sprach, was geht uns das an, was geht uns das an, was geht uns das an, was geht uns das Und er warf die Silberlinge in den Tempel, hob sich davon, ging hin und erhängte sich selbst. Aber die hohen Priester nahmen die Silberlinge und sprachen, es taucht das, das Bild auf, mit das Bild Gott und das Bild Gott und das Bild Denn es ist Blutsgeld, denn es ist Blutsgeld. Thank you. 
das Geld, den Mörderlohn. Seht das Geld, den Mörderlohn, für euch ihr verlorene Sohn zu in Küsten now turn to scene 12 and this is Jesus before Pontius Pilate and this scene probably has more drama both in the words but also musically than um, almost any other part of this passion although it starts off in a rather um, slow manner um, Bach ties up some loose ends of what to do with the 30 pieces of silver that uh, Judas threw on the temple floor and he talks about and uh, as the Gospel of Matthew talks about that it was decided to buy a field with these as a place for a potter's field which was a place to bury those who could not afford their own place to be buried and then we quickly move into Jesus and Pilate operating together talking together as a uh, sort of comment here, when we get to number 52, we get to the last words that Jesus will speak until he is on the cross. As this section progresses, the accompaniment gets more and more sparse, as if to emphasize that Jesus is more and more isolated. And I want you to note in 52, as the evangelist sings towards the end, he sings the word vort word in the last phrase this is being used as a foreshadowing all right you notice that he sings a very high note with the word being lifted up on the cross in number 53 Bach returns to the passion chorale for the third time we will hear this again very shortly Bach uses the the passion chorale to sort of frame this whole series here, um, once towards the beginning of this and then once towards the end. Here we see Jesus. He's been betrayed. He's been denied. He's had false witnesses testify against him. He's now before the most powerful official in the region who controls his fate. From all appearances, there seems to be no good way out of this. Instead, Bach reminds us through this very familiar chorale that the God of the clouds, air, and winds, and the German is great, der Wolken, Luft, and Winden, the God of the clouds, air, and winds will prepare a path where your feet can walk. What a great comfort in times of trial. Like I mentioned, Bach will return to this chorale shortly after Jesus has been sentenced to die as if framing this entire scene. Mm -hmm. 
Sie hielten aber einen Rat und kauften einen Töpfers Acker darum zum Begräbnis der Pilger. Daher ist derselbige Acker genannt, der Blutacker, bis auf den heutigen Tag. Da ist erfüllt, das gesagt ist durch den Propheten Jeremias, da er spricht. Sie haben genommen 30 Silberlinge, damit bezahlt war der Verkaufte, welchen sie kauften von den Kindern Israel und haben sie gegeben um einen Töpfers Acker, als mir der Herr befohlen hat. Jesus aber stund vor dem Landpfleger und der Landpfleger fragte ihn und sprach, bist du der jeden König? Jesus aber sprach zu ihm, du sagest. Und da er verklagt war von den hohen Priestern und Ältesten, antwortete er nicht. Da sprach Pilatus zu ihm, Hörst du nicht, wie hart sie dich verklagen? Und er antwortete ihm nicht auf ein Wort, also, dass sich auch der Landpfleger sehr verwundete. Well, we're going to end this session on that. But before we move on, I want to return back to what the last chorale said, because it's very appropriate for where we find ourselves here in the year 2020, in a time of uncertainty, in a time of we're not sure where the path is ahead of us, what the world is going to look like, here is what Bach tells us, and I will read straight from the English translation of the chorale. Commend your ways, and all that weighs heavy on your heart, to the truest care of him who rules the heavens. He who gives the clouds, the air, the winds, their courses, their path, their orbit, he will also find ways where your feet can walk. What more can we possibly hear than that God, who is the God of the universes, is also the God of us here and now. I look forward to seeing you in our last and final session coming up next.